Rod Steiger is such a good talker on the November 19th, 91 episode of, of Later with Bob Costas. They just kept the cameras rolling and let him go. And go he does. He focuses in on, in this episode on him and his depression and his battles with bipolar or manic or whatever and talks about being on medicine but seeing how he can rile himself way up and come way down real quickly and, and get very emotional. I don't think they quite got his meds right. He really bears his soul in this interview. This is a good one and Bob didn't have to ask many questions. The, the one at, toward the end where he, he said, hey, how do I fit into this? Am, am I just something that you're thinking about something else or are you actually responding to me? It was a great question. And Steiger's answer was <laughs> revealing what a gripping interview. Thanks for staying up later. Rod Steiger is back with us. Sometimes we don't know if these are going to be one show or two, and we got in the middle of talking with Rod. We found it interesting enough. The cameras just kept on going well past the allotted time for one show, so let's pick it up where we left off. You had a chance to do Patton. Oh. What happened? Oh, uh, well, all right. Uh, I had just gotten the Academy Award. I was in good health. <laughs> mentally, I can't, you know, anyway, I thought I was in good health mentally. And when you're good health, when you're feeling good, your philosophies are as strong as your mental health and your physical health. When you don't feel good, your philosophy is in danger. You can be attacked. You can be wangled into doing something that you don't want to do. Well, I was feeling like the cock of the walk, excuse the expression, everything was wonderful. I read Patton, and I'm basically a, uh, a would-be pacifist, right? I say would-be because I forget sometimes because I get angry. And I read this, and I very grandly throw the script across the room. Say, I will not glorify war. I will not glorify... Well, what a schmuck I was. What an <laughs> idiot I was. Well, it was the biggest business mistake of my life. Because if I had done Patton as half as good as Mr. Scott did it, I might have had a chance to get into The Godfather. If I would have won an Academy Award, there would have been a good chance, you know. I mean, Brando did it brilliantly. I'm not talking about that. But, I mean, it was the biggest business mistake it set my career back I don't know the only other thing to set my career back why I haven't worked much in the last eight years and that was the, the depressive period I was depressed for eight years that crippled my career you know that crippled but I'm back and I'm in good shape now and my acting's coming back into form again and I you know I hope to continue but Patton was I was an idiot an idiot when you say your acting's coming back into form again uh, obviously in this period where you were on the sidelines, you got rusty. Your skills uh, Not a question of rusty. No, it's a question. Uh, to me, it's a basic logic. If your mind's in trouble, everything about you is in trouble. If your mind's not clear, your acting's not clear. If your mind's not clear, your loving's not clear. If your mind's not clear, your marriage is not clear. You're in trouble. Uh, depression, which I have, which is a chemical depression, uh, I have to take medicines for the rest of my life, and I will not apologize for it. I just came from Chicago, where I gave a keynote speech for groups connected with the National Mental Health Institute, where I said I will not have people com com uh, condemned for personal pain and dealing with a disease like schizophrenia and depression are. These are diseases. You are not insane. You are not wacko. You're not half off your rocker. You know, I'm sorry to do a lecture, but I'm very hot on a thing like that. So what happened, and I realized only a month or two ago, because of my stupid narcissism, I said, my God, one of the reasons you weren't employed, because your acting couldn't have been, well, how good it was, I don't know, but it couldn't have been up to snuff, because your mind, you were chemically uh, unbalanced, your brain wasn't working correctly, you know? Give me an example of a time on film when you took a chance, did something that even you weren't sure would work out, and you hit it out of the park. And another time where you could look at the film now and say, I missed it, I screwed it up. Uh, I always take a chance in a sense. Now let me explain that so it doesn't sound so ridiculous. I know, I try to know what I'm doing, who, who's in the scene, what I'm in the scene. I'm talking about the characters, what the scene's about, where it takes place, what do I want from this human being, what is the theme of the play, and etc. I believe, especially in films, the acting that I grew up with 
you should know everything as an actor except how. I mean, I used to drive career. I remember when I did Marty here on television, I drove poor Dell man crazy. He said, well, when, <laughs> when you get in the scene, what's going to happen here? I said, I can't tell you what's going to happen until my mother comes in and tells me. I should stop being lonely and going out with girls. I know about loneliness. I know about girls. Acting is reacting. Let's see what happens. That's the excitement of acting for me. Let's see what happens. Now, when you find something that's got a good truth in it in life, it becomes what they might call inspirational, which means you and the audience discovered something new about living at the same time. The actor comes off the stage or off the set. They stop rolling. He said, what the hell was that? That's what I always go through. When I did The Pawnbroker, I mean, my best moment of acting was when I came out the door, there's this boy who worked for me, who had become like a son to me. He shot, he's bleeding on the streets of Spanish Harlem. And I looked down and there his blood and everything. And to help me get in the scene, I was thinking of my daughter. That's all I had to think about. That's my daughter lying there, dying, and I can do nothing. And I especially, then I tried to use, all this goes into acting, the props. It was chocolate syrup for the blood, right? But no, by now it's my daughter's blood. And I picked it up and I looked at my hands and there's my child's blood. And in the script, I'm supposed to put my head back and I'm supposed to scream in anguish and pain and rage at God or whoever you believe in. And when I did that, I thought of Picasso's painting of Guernica in the Museum of Modern Art. This is all going in infinitesimal seconds. Your mind goes much, doesn't even know, a second's 40 miles as far as your brain's concerned, right? And I remember he had these women's faces back with their mouth open and their tongues out. And obviously you couldn't hear a sound because it's a painting, but it was the loudest scream I ever heard in my life. And my intellect and my instinct came together at the same time, that's when acting's at its best, and something in me said, don't make a sound, but look like you're screaming. I said, no shooting. I said, no, no, it'll hurt you. No, no, it'll hurt you. No, no, it'll hurt you. to me was the highest moment I ever had in acting. The worst moment I think I ever had in the acting was when I did this picture called January Man. I was still in my depression. And when you're in a depression, sometimes you panic and you push yourself to feel like he, the pawnbroker put his hand down on the spindle. And I was acting this scene in which I got mad. And I was beginning to feel things again, which I hadn't felt for seven, eight years as an actor. And I wanted to feel it more. And the first thing you know, I was so mad, God couldn't stop me. Well, it was way over the top. As you obviously, it was way over the top. But I became drunk with feeling again. When I saw the picture, especially one of the actors in the picture, the more I went up, the more he went down. Right? When I saw the picture, I realized I was not functioning with the balance that I was used to. And the director, God help him, was in so in awe of the cast that he had. That everybody thought, you know, the higher I went, nobody, nobody had the guts to come up and say, you know, I don't give a damn who you are. We got, it's too much. If you're really in shape, emotionally, intellectually, and in touch with your talent, would you inevitably still reach a point where there wouldn't be enough to draw upon? For example, what you just described from The Pawnbroker, and I remember that scene very, very well, that extraordinarily articulate, nonverbal moment. You drew upon your feelings for your own daughter. After a while, there aren't... No, I drew upon two things. And, and Picasso's painting, uh, yeah. yes. You drew upon those things, but after a while, if you keep coming back to things that are dear to you and things that have moved you, eventually it can't have the same visceral result. Do you well, run out of things? Each day is a different world. 
As we move through the world, it's like we collect the dust of the day before on us, and it grows on us as we get older. As we get too old, maybe the dust becomes too heavy and it kills us. But each day is a different world in a different time in a different place. Your, your wife is different, your lovers are different, your husbands are different. It's a different world for us. So your imagination, if you keep your eyes open and work with it, becomes stimulated for different reasons from different perspectives. Now, there's a game I play when I get stuck when I think, Jesus, I can't think of anything. I take a walk through, let's say, one of the big department stores in New York. I start on the first floor. So what does perfume mean to my character? What does perfume mean to me? Second floor, what does women's lingerie mean to me? Third floor, what does men's clothing mean to me? Fourth floor, what does sport? And all of a sudden, my mind starts to make up crazy things. By the way, I do not look good in women's lingerie. I, <laughs> it just doesn't work for me. But this is an exercise, an exercise in, in imagination. I get an acting class. When I came to this acting class, I didn't want to take the class, but my old teacher was sick from the Moscow Art Theater, and he asked me would I take over the class. I said, fine, okay. I came in with the poetry of Hausman, the poetry of E.E. E. Cummings, the poetry of T.S. Eliot, the poetry of of uh, William Shakespeare. I came in with two reproductions of Manet and uh, the painter and Van Gogh the painter. I came in with the very sentimental Claire de Lune by Debussy and I came in with Beethoven's Eroica. I came in with an article how Olympic athletes, because it was an Olympic year, prepared themselves, fooled themselves to get their energy up. One athlete would stay up all night because he knew that would, there was no way he could win the race. He got so afraid of not winning the race because he stayed up, he won the race. His adrenaline was up. And I did some of the two of the best jokes I knew. It took me about two and a half hours. I closed all the books, all the music, showed the paintings. And then I said to him, now, if none of this has touched any of you in this room, get the hell out of the acting business. You have to know an actor's got to be like a... He's got to know a little bit about painting, a little bit about music, a little bit about psychology. In other words, he should be, he can't be a jack of all trades, but he should have knowledge of it. And the only thing he should be a master of, if he's lucky, is his acting. But everything relates to acting. Everything relates to acting. I can look at you and see the King Kong behind you while I talk to you. And it makes me think of how many times I've seen this movie. I can do a scene where somebody says, well, you know what, this is the kind of guy would do with this and that. And the director says, you know what type of person this is? This is the kind of person would knock King Kong off the top of the Empire State Building. That's the son of a bitch he is. I can understand that. Because I had some experience. You understand? I'm putting it on a childish mm -hmm. level. This is the kind of person that would use for, for laboratory purposes the manuscript of Beethoven's music. Oh. Oh, he's in trouble. He's in trouble with me. I'll break his head. I'll kill this son of a... And you can work the other way. This is the kind of person that would give flowers to a man on the street plus a hundred dollar bill. I don't know, whatever you want yeah. to use in your imagination. But you've got to know a little about everything in the world. Everybody should do this. Never mind actors, schmackters. Are you like this moment to moment? Now you've come to probably the most personal moment of whatever we're doing here. I have come to the conclusion, with the verification of my beloved wife, Paula, who saved my life when I wanted to kill myself a couple of times in the Depression. It seems fairly obvious, doesn't it, ladies and gentlemen, I exist on outside stimuli? And it's sad. You get me going and challenge me, I'll go like mad, right? If something doesn't come along that wakes me up, I'm the biggest, fattest hippopotamus in the mud. Get me mad, you're going to have problems. Challenge me, you're going to see something. Maybe, maybe good, maybe bad, but it's going to bring me alive. Put me on a talk show, I come alive. I leave the show, I go back to the hotel, I read the newspapers, cheap magazines, and I wait till tonight till I go to the theater. Maybe that's why I became an actor. Maybe that's why I became an actor, because I love challenge. Southern Circuit Riders never worked a 
do you doubt how talented you are? Every time I go to work, I think I can't do it most of the time. Especially after the depression, I lost a great deal of confidence. When I was young, I mean, what can I tell you? They said, well, okay, you're gonna do a thing called the pawnbroker. I said, I, I'll tell you how stupid I was. They were gonna do War and Peace as a movie. Fred Zinnemann was gonna direct it. Michael Todd, who was a great producer mm -hmm. in the past, was there, called me in his office. And he said to me, you know, Fred Zinnemann wants you to play the lead in this picture, War and Peace. You only have one other person who's com com competing for you for the part of Pierre. I said, who? He said, Lawrence Olivier. I said, well, he'll do it his way. I'll do it my way. That's how cocky it was. Came the Depression, started, which happens with every human being. Forget acting. When something goes wrong, I don't know if I can get up today. I don't know if I'll remember. Then comes these terrible visualizations, breaking down in front of the camera, losing control. Now, all these things, my, I was lucky because I had money enough in the bank that I could take, go to doctors and take care of myself. I do not know how these dear people call average, which is an insult to begin with, how they went to work from nine to five with a depression. I am a coward compared to them because I had money in the bank. I could take eight years off. How many people can take eight years off and try to get cured and do nothing? I came down in the morning at 10 o'clock, said good morning my wife, I sat on the couch, looked at the ocean till nine o'clock that night and said good night and that was the conversation in the house year after year after year. And my wife didn't kill me, she's a miracle. What could happen, you're 66 now, what could happen in the next 10 years for you professionally, personally, that would give your life closure in the way you want it. Drop dead in front of a camera on the stage. Drop dead without lingering. Oh. I have a little fear of death, but that it comes unannounced and doesn't tell me in what form. That is the fear I have most. Lingering, I never want to have in my life a lingering death. Let it be sweet, quick, and immediate. Like the end of a good poem, bang, done, finished. And weep for the living, don't weep for the dead. I got a friend of mine died yesterday. My feelings for him are still the same. But he's gone, he's gone on to a better place, I hope. That's another thing, as you get older, maybe that's how you excuse yourself. Maybe that's how you prepare yourself to depart. I now begin to think of death as maybe a step forward. I have to, because human beings are childish. I have to have an element of hope in what I'm thinking of at 66. It's a step forward, Rod. Keep telling yourself, you're going on to a better place. Who knows, you may go on to nothing. Who knows, you may go on to a worse place. But you gotta think, no, it's gonna be better. It's gonna be better, but let it be quick. By how emotional you found yourself here in this conversation? I eat better. <laughs> I walk better. I live better because I'm emotional. It's my business. That's my job. Being myself, trying to examine acting through the medium of acting in front of another person or thousands of persons or millions of persons on the screen. I mean, I'm a ham, I'm an actor. If I were sitting here and your voice was on tape and nobody was in this studio except a cat, I'd be wondering if the cat's paying attention to me.
I mean, that's how childish and hammy I am. I am what's called an actor. God knows what that is. God knows. It's a kaleidoscope of impulses and fears and terrors and joys that nobody's ever figured out. But that's also a definition of a human being. I'm a human being who tries to perform in public. You perform in public to a degree. Everybody out there in the studio doing the show is performing every day. I mean performing in the right sense. I mean trying to get through the damn day, trying to be as honest, trying to get as much feeling and as much love and desire and respect. I'm a big sucker for respect. And maybe because my family was alcoholic, people used to laugh at my mother because she was alcoholic. I had to pull her out of bars when I was a kid of nine years old. I'm not asking for pity. This is life. What happens It's a disease. I didn't know it then. I know it now. I pulled her out. The kids in the neighborhood used to make jokes. The people used to laugh at the name of Steiger. And somewhere inside of me, I must have sworn, someday, you SOB, someday I'll do something good enough. You will not laugh at the name Steiger. I think that's part of what drives me on, the need for respect. I'm childish about that. I can't stand it when people come up and say, hello, Rod Baby, I've never met before. My impulse is to kill. It's childish, it's Victorian, but I love it. I asked this question not to turn the spotlight on myself. It could be anybody sitting here, but I think people might wonder about this. Since your self-definition as an actor is always part of you. What are you seeing when you're talking to me? Are you just seeing someone you met this morning and now you've talked to for whatever period of time? Or are you seeing and imagining other things? Oh no, now we're talking about concentration. Concentration to me is very simple. I have to make you more important at this given moment. And make sure, what am I doing if this was an acting scene? I'm trying to clarify to you my beliefs my, my legends about living. So I can sit here and I can see the cameras over here, I can see King Kong over there, I can see the lamp here, the jukebox behind you. Out of the corner of my eyes is somebody kneeling down in the studio over here. But I have learned as an actor, I am concentrating on clarifying to you whatever you think is Rod Steiger. What I see, I'm looking about as a very intelligent, a person with some, some ambitions, fairly well dressed, a person who knows and has done their homework, a person who's got a sense of humor, and a few things I'd rather not go into. <laughs> Pretty much seized the forum over the last couple of nights, huh? That's why some of my friends call me Caesar, I think. <laughs> no. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you All very right. much. Rod Steiger. See you later. Thank you for watching Cleveland Live Music. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button. There's further patronage information in the video descriptions below. Thanks for all the support and making the channel grow.